All right, we are going to segue into our next speaker, who I believe is here, Dr. Jameson. Yes, I'm here. Hello. Hi. I want to introduce you and then we'll get started. Thank you so much for coming today. We really appreciate your time on the weekend and we're very happy to have you here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So we have with us Dr. Jameson. She is the Dean of the Physician Assistant Program at Stanford University. Dr. Jameson is a clinical professor in the Department of Pediatrics and Medicine, Division of Pediatric Care Cardiology and Cardiovascular Medicine. She completed her PA education at Northeastern University, where she also received a master's degree and a doctorate in law and policy with a concentration in health policy. Dr. Jameson has held numerous leadership positions in over her 28 year career. She is currently the Associate Dean for PA Education and the Program Director for the Master of Science in the PA Studies Program. When not providing leadership for PA Education at Stanford, Dr. Jameson provides care to adolescent and adult survivors of congenital heart disease and dedicates time to research focused on important and improving access to specialized healthcare for adult survivors of pediatric diseases. That's, that's amazing. A lot of wealth of ex, uh, knowledge and experience you can uh, draw from today. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I am going to share my screen, if you don't mind. So some slides for everyone. Uh, oops, wrong one. Uh, let's see. Uh, is it sharing that? Hold on. Yes. It looked like was it? It looked like it was sharing my full screen though. Mm -hmm. Or no? Yeah. If you, you just have to go. Yep. Full is screen. it just screen, uh, sharing the PowerPoint? Yeah. You just have to go full screen on your PowerPoint. That little green button on the top left. Yep. Okay. Great. Thank you. <laughs> I'm a little technologically challenged. All right. Thank you so much uh, for giving me the opportunity to talk to you about the Stanford University uh, Master of Science and PA Studies program. So Stanford, we've been educating PAs for over 50 years. Uh, initially, it was called the Primary Care Associate Program, and it was actually uh, in a collaboration with Foothill Community College. And so students at that time were not actually Stanford University students, they were Foothill College students, but in collaboration with Stanford Medicine were trained and educated. And we trained uh, somewhere around the about 1200 uh, PAs in that model. In 2017, we matriculated our first students into the Master of Science and PA Studies program. And these students are Stanford University students. And we'll talk uh, about some unique things about the program now that it's transitioned to Stanford. So one of the things I tell individuals who are thinking about PA education and they're thinking about, well, what program is the right program for me? You really need to look at the mission and goals of the program and see how they fit with your long-term goals. And not only is it important for you to make sure that you're in the right program, but also we are held sort of per accreditation standards to be sure that we're bringing in students that help us meet our mission and goals. So when we're looking at you as a candidate, we want to see how well you match those. So at Stanford, uh, we have six goals for our program. One of them is we want to recruit diverse and highly qualified applicants who can successfully complete our program, which we feel is uh, quite rigorous. We want to educate PAs to provide patient-centered care as members of an interprofessional healthcare team. You heard how important it is to be able to be part of a team. Uh, we want to prepare graduates with the medical knowledge and skills to enter clinical practice. We want to prepare graduates to practice in medically underserved and health professional shortage areas. We also want to prepare graduates to practice in the Stanford healthcare community. One of the reasons why this program was uh, so well received when we uh, went to leadership at Stanford University is they really saw this as a pipeline for our uh, healthcare entity that we have at Stanford. And one of the things that we think sets our program apart from some other PA programs is we're really focused on developing future PA leaders. Myself and our associate uh, program director have held numerous leadership roles as PAs, and we both sort of talked about that we never felt like during our education we were given the foundation um, to take on some of these leadership roles. And I think that's why many PAs are hesitant to step into hospital leadership roles or research leadership roles. And so we wanted to embed that throughout our curriculum to really uh, help prepare PAs to be leaders. But we also want to look for candidates who have leadership potential coming into the program to help us meet that goal. 
There's a lot of unique things about Stanford. I always say we're not your average PA program. Uh, we'll go through what some of those things are that I think are different. Obviously, I'm a little biased, but I think we have an absolutely beautiful campus. I'm originally from the East Coast, lived there my whole life until I came out to Stanford 12 years ago. Uh, and it really is a breathtaking campus. Um, and as those that maybe are from outside the West Coast, the weather is amazing. So for me, uh, being from Boston and being here in, in April and having this beautiful weather is really remarkable. Um, you know, we have state-of-the-art facilities, both in the simulation labs is, uh, that we have here in our learning building. This is our learning center where the simulation labs are, the um, classrooms where you take courses, where you do advanced clinical skills. And then right literally within a short walking distance, we have our two uh, hospitals. So this is the brand new Stanford Healthcare uh, Hospital. There are 600 plus beds in that hospital. And this is our brand new uh, pediatric, this is the uh, brand new pediatric hospital that we have as well. Sorry, I gave it backwards to you, but um, you know, just beautiful facilities uh, here for, for us to tap into. And also we try to do innovative things in the classroom, such as a cl uh, flipped classroom approach. So uh, several of our courses where you'll actually do upfront learning on your own, and then you come into the classroom and then you're um, going through cases or going through particular um, uh, pathophysiology. And then we do have a cadaver lab. Our students um, do dissection. So they're paired up uh, with our medical students and have uh, fresh cadavers that they work through uh, through the anatomy course. And then they actually go back to the anatomy lab later in their education and do advanced clinical skills in the lab, things like intubation and chest tube and LPs and putting in central lines and things like that. So our program is about 31 months long. Um, we have the didactic component, which is five quarters, and then a clerkship component, which is uh, one year. I say 31 months because our students actually do get the first summer off, and we'll talk a reason why that is, partly with the integration of our curriculum with our medical students. Um, so the students do three quarters, have the summer off, and then they come back and do two more quarters before they go off to clerkship. <clears throat> and I will say that, you know, when we were thinking about developing this program, so I was one of the um, people that put the proposal together for for this program. And I was really hesitant about that first summer off because, you know, I went to a PA program that, you know, you march through the full 27 months and actually was really surprised that the students loved it. <laughs> they loved being able to get a break. They loved being able to go off and travel for that first summer or work on their research projects. So you'll hear from some of our students, maybe they'll agree or, or disagree with me, but I was surprised at how much they actually embraced having that first summer off. During the entire time that students are in the program, um, they do select a leadership track. So we have leadership tracks in community health, medical education, clinical research, health services and policy research and health administration and leadership. And so they'll pick one of those tracks and in that track, they'll do uh, some coursework and then they'll do a master's thesis. And it's interesting, um, we are very open and receptive to student feedback. So we didn't initially have a health administration and leadership track. And we had some students that came to us and said, can we pilot it? And we said, sure. And they did. It was highly successful. And then we added it as one of our leadership tracks. The other thing that's unique about our program is we don't have classes five days a week. Um, I always say to the students that Wednesday is not the day to go off surfing. <laughs> the, the Wednesday is the day to work on uh, your scholarly work or to take electives. Um, and I did say that, yes, our students do take electives. Um, so this is a typical schedule for the for first quarter. Um, you can see on Mondays they'll have a course in the morning and then you know pretty much the afternoons that they're in class, they're in uh, class all afternoon. Um, but again, Wednesday is really reserved for um, you know scholarly work and uh, electives. This is what our um, didactic curriculum looks like, which I think you're gonna see it's pretty similar as most uh, PA programs. So, we have a Foundations of Clinical Medicine course. And so this course here includes things like genetics and biochemistry um, and immunology. And the reason why we put this course here is that we recognize that students come into our program with varying degrees of um, basic sciences. And we really wanna make sure that everybody's on the same playing field before we get into more complex uh, stuff. So this first quarter tends to be much more of a review. 
Our students uh, take histology, embryology, and clinical anatomy with our medical students. So you're in the classroom with them, you're taking the same courses that they do. And our students perform at the same level that the medical students do, they do just as well. Um, they also take the practice of medicine course with the medical students, and that traverses uh, five quarters. And that's the course where you learn uh, history taking, physical exam skills, do some uh, advanced clinical skills. And it also has a whole potpourri of things in there, like nutrition or quantitative medicine, uh, health policy. So it really is kind of a catch-all for things that ne don't necessarily fit in the other buckets. We have um, courses that are specifically dedicated to sort of PAs, which is called PAs in Healthcare. Uh, and we have PAs Healthcare 1 through 4. So PAs in Healthcare 1 is really more of an introduction to the profession. And I'll talk about the other ones as we get uh, sort of further into the curriculum here. We do have a dedicated clinical therapeutics class, which is really like a pharmacology class, but really a clinical application of that. Um, and we try to match that up by what is also happening in that practice of medicine course. So as an example, when you're learning um, you know, clinical therapeutics of cardiac meds, you're probably doing the, the cardiac exam within that practice of medicine course. And then similarly, our principles of clinical medicine course, which is our pathophysiology, you'll be learning cardiology in there as well. Um, we introduced this course called Foundations of Clinical Neurosciences because we felt that our students needed a little bit more hands-on approach to understanding neurology and psychiatry and things like that. And this is really a nice hands-on course that's really, a, it is a foundation. It's just to make sure that people understand the principles. So then for quarters three, four, and five, you continue to take the pharmacology course, the pathophysiology course, and then that uh, practice of medicine where you're learning those, uh, how to uh, take care of a patient. So how to do those history, physical exam type of things. When we get into quarter four, we get back to that PAs in healthcare. And this is when we start to introduce um, what the clerkship year is going to look like. We start to introduce more um, hands-on skills, such as you know a little bit more suturing and casting. Uh, we do an EENT workshop. And then in PAs in healthcare three is where I mentioned that we go back to the anatomy lab and really do some um, intense advanced clinical skills there. And then in quarter six through nine, our students are off at clerkship. And we do have callback days uh, each month after the rotations. We'll go a little bit more through the clerkships. And those uh, callback days are called PAs in Healthcare 4. And during those days, we do a sort of a reflection session on, you know, how are things been going out in the clerkship. We do a um, preparedness for practice thread. So in this course, we teach you how to put your resume together, um, how to uh, do interview skills. And then we also do uh, leadership skills within there as well. So we have nine core um, clerkships that our students do. We do internal medicine one and two. Each clerkship is a month long. So for internal medicine, you do two four month blocks. We have primary care, family medicine one and two, again, uh, two four month blocks. Uh, two one month block, sorry. And then you do a month in pediatrics, general surgery, emergency medicine, women's health. We do have a dedicated behavioral medicine rotation, which I think is important. Um, and we also have three electives that we allow our students to take. I'll talk to you in a minute about this sort of clean, uh, senior clerkship that we do. Uh, I mentioned the callback days. Our students do take end of rotation exams. Those are shelf exams uh, put out by the PA Education Association. Um, so our students take that every month. Our rotations are uh, predominantly uh, in the Bay Area. Um, Stanford Healthcare is a big healthcare entity. So I mentioned we have the two hospitals already. Stanford actually also owns a hospital in Pleasanton. So it's about, for those that don't know, it's about 30 miles from Stanford uh, on the East Bay. It's called Stanford Tri-Valley. Uh, and then we have a collaborative uh, effort with the VA hospital. So all of our students do behavioral medicine at the VA, as well as uh, some other things like surgery, internal medicine. In addition to this, and sort of this is our commitment to sort of underserved um, communities, is that we have two hubs where we also send students for training. So all of our students do typically somewhere about two or three rotations in a rural or underserved area. 
And our two hubs are in the Fresno area and then in Imperial County down at the Mexican border. We do provide housing for students as long as it's at least 50 miles from Stanford. Um, even though Tri-Valley is not quite 50 miles, we have an apartment across from the hospital there. And I will preface it to say that it is based on grant funding and funding that we get from the hospitals. And so if that ever runs out, you know, then we might not have housing. But right now we're really uh, proud to offer um, anytime you leave sort of the Bay Area that you would have housing. And we have um, actually an uh, apartment we built from a trailer, a three bedroom apartment on the hospital grounds uh, at this hospital down here and near the Mexican border. And we also have faculty members that are stationed here. So we have a faculty member who is works and lives in the, in the Central Valley, Fresno area. And we have somebody down here in the Imperial County as well. One of the things that we're um, doing this year, we're trying a piloting a senior clerkship. And so our students finish in April. Uh, the Stanford University graduation is not until June. So they, they basically have one quarter that until they actually get their, you know, go to the ceremony for graduation, they do get a graduation date in April. But this year um, we offered that students could stay an extra quarter and continue to train in an area that they were interested in training. And the interesting thing is that per the taking the national boards and also getting a license, at least in the state of California, you're just required to complete the PA program. You're not necessarily required to graduate. So our students during the senior clerkship still go get their board certification, get their license, but they're getting this additional training at the same time. Other unique thing I think about Stanford is that we're pass fail. All of the School of Medicine is pass fail. Um, so typically a pass is around a 70%. Um, so uh, we try to eliminate the sort of competitiveness among students and try to get them to work more collaboratively. And we feel that the pass fail grading system helps us accomplish that. Uh, just commenting on our resources as far as um, we take less than 30 students a year, so somewhere between 28 to 30 students a year, and I'll go through sort of what our uh, program personnel is, and you'll see uh, how well resourced we are given the size of our program. Um, so we have our typical leadership team. I think what's a little bit different than usual is our associate medical director and medical director are nearly half time, so between the two of them, they are full time. And they are very visible and very involved in the program. And you'll see in other programs in the country that the medical directors are not as involved. You know, and that might be good or bad. Um, I think for us, it's been a, a huge value add for our program. We also have a full-time um, director of administration for our program. Uh, our core faculty here. So we have um, one, two, three, four, five, <laughs> like five core faculty members right now. Uh, we do actually have a position open for six, so that's why I hesitated for a second. Um, one of our core faculty members is actually a pharmacist who um, oversees all of our pharmacology curriculum, and he also um, oversees all of our student scholarship as well. And then we have a, a handful, more than a handful of instructional faculty members. And all of these faculty members here are at least 20%. So one day a week is dedicated to the program. And then they all work clinically the other um, four days per week. So we're really um, happy to have them as part of our team. And they're, they're teaching, they're mentoring, um, they're helping with workshops. So they're very involved in the program. And then this is our administrative team. Um, I think that uh, we're very lucky to have the resources we do for our administrative team. So I mentioned already, Ms. Sinsman is our director for administration. We have a, a grants and data analytic person who's just amazing um, pre-clerkship and uh, clerkship coordinators. And we have some additional coordinators here. One of the things that we brought in um, over the last year is our dedicated learning specialist for the program. And actually, um, Dr. Santos Gori just left us and he's going to a, a university in um, Colorado, but we just opened the position. So we hope to hire into that position soon. And then we have a student life officer who works with students um, and helps us plan student events. And then we have a financial analyst as well. Uh, one of the things obviously people want to look at when you're looking at programs is the pants pass rate. So you can see our overall pass rate is 99%. I'm proud to say we've had 20 
of our 28 um, class of 2023, because they're all taking pants these past couple of weeks and everyone that's taken it so far has passed. So fingers crossed we'll be 100% this year as well. Um, but so we've done very well with our, our pants pass rate. Interesting thing about our prerequisites. We don't have many prerequisites to the program. Uh, you need a bachelor's degree from a regionally accredited academic institution in the United States and Canada. And we do require students, uh, applicants to take CASPER, which is a, a computer-based assessment for sampling personnel characteristics. I will say um, in full transparency that we do not use the CASPER test as a um, decision maker of whether someone gets in the program or not. So if you're applying to Stanford and you take this test, don't get too stressed about it. Um, we're trying to see how this correlates with how PA students do um, and whether this is actually even a useful test for us in admission. So for right now, we're just um, gathering data to decide whether we will use this in the admission process in the future. We do have recommendations. We want, you know, we need a, an applicant to convince us that they can actually successfully complete the program. Um, and so we have recommendations that we put out there. And the more of our recommendations that you um, provide to us, the more likely you are to be a competitive applicant. So we like to see a student complete some type of standardized test to show us that you can take a standardized test. It is not mandatory. And yes, we've taken plenty of students who have not taken a standardized test. We like to see a letter of recommendation from a physician from a PA and from somebody who can speak to your academic success, typically a professor or an advisor. Um, we um, like to see you complete our Stanford specific essay um, that we have. We don't have a supplemental essay, it's all within the CASPA application. And the courses that we recommend is that you've taken anatomy and physiology, general chemistry, organic chemistry, um, biostatistics, psychology, and then we'd like to see at least three upper division science classes. And I listed some of them here, but it's really, is it an upper division science class at your institution? Um, so if we don't already have your institution on the list, we actually go and look and make sure that um, it's an upper division per your institution. I will say we recommend three. The more you have, the more competitive you are because then you're convincing us that you can really handle uh, the academic rigor. And then preparatory experience. We like to see people have um, at least 500 hours of hands-on clinical experience, just so that like we know that you know what you're getting into, that you, you've experienced the healthcare environment. Have we ever taken a student without healthcare experience? Yes, we have. Um, and in fact, you know, you could ask me about any of the courses. Have we ever taken a student that didn't have one of these courses? Yes, we have. Um, and we like to see individuals have some clinical research experience, not necessarily bench experience, you know, research experience with mice and things like that, but research experience where you're interacting with patients. And we like to see the volunteer and community service uh, piece. And I'll mention that, you know, I was one of the drivers to not have any mandates for uh, these type of things. And the reason being is that I don't want to deny an applicant who's phenomenal because they didn't take a chemistry course. If they had everything else they needed um, or had something else that offset that, I want to be able to take that student. And when we put in hard lines, and this is probably an important uh, note for applicants, if we say you have to have anatomy and physiology to get in, we actually can't take you unless you have it because it's against the accreditation standards. So we can actually get in trouble if we take you and you didn't have it. So by us not having those mandates, it gives us a lot more flexibility to take students that we wouldn't otherwise be able to take. So our admission overview, um, there's a first sort of eligibility and initial review. So uh, we do an academic review. We look at your GPA, both at the undergraduate institution. We look at course load. We look at your preparatory course load, those recommended courses, and we look at your standardized test scores. And we also look at non-academic review, looking at diversity indicators, how many extracurricular achievements, awards, honors, things like that that you've been involved with. One of the things that we try to do in this phase one is identify what your academic risk is. So what is the risk of us taking you into the program? How well are you going to be? How are you going to succeed in the program? If someone you know, has all those recommended courses that we've seen, They've had a, you know, a strong GPA, maybe they had strong standardized test scores. I can be very confident that you're going to do well in the program. 
And then I don't look at that again. Once, that, once we decide that we think you can handle the academic rigor of the program, then we're looking at the rest of your application and who you are as an individual and what you can contribute to our program. Uh, our phase two is really a comprehensive review. We have uh, PAs within the Stanford Healthcare community that do part of the phase two review. So they'll look at an application and then after that, it will come to our admission committee. And we're looking at things like clinical experience, research publications, uh, volunteer experience, leadership that you've had, letters of recommendations and essays. And then, you know, those little things that what sets you apart from other applicants, you know, the journey that you've had to get to where you are, um, anything that might be unique about this individual. Um, because as you heard from our prior presenter, it, we're getting so many applicants. So we had, uh, I think, 2,400 applicants our last admission cycle. Uh, we reviewed 1,500 applicants, and we have to narrow that down to, you know, less than 30. And so, you know, if we're convinced you can handle the academic rigor, you know, as I said, we put that aside and now we're looking at you as a candidate and how are you, um, how do you stand out compared to other applicants? And I'll go back to what I talked about in the beginning, which is how well do you meet our mission and goals, the program, right? And, and can you speak to that in your application? Our phase through is interviews. I know the question will come up is what type of interviews we do because I heard it on the other one. We do a panel interview. It's typically there's a student on the panel along with an instructional faculty member and a principal faculty member typically. And we are continuing to do those remote again this year. Um, we also do a writing sample at the time of the, the interview as well. And then there's an information session. So it is pretty much a full day for that as well. And then phase four is um, the admission part. All this comes at a price. I don't set the tuition at Stanford. Uh, someone else does that. Uh, I think right now it works out to be about $180,000 to complete the program. You know, that can be uh, incredibly uh, overwhelming um, to some individuals. But um, as I said, we don't, we are, we're not, <laughs> not in charge of doing the tuition and fees at Stanford. However, okay, great. we- that, that's oh. above your pay grade, right? <laughs> It certainly is. Well, I actually, asked, I was like, that's ridiculous. We don't want to be that expensive. And they said, we don't give the discount for a Stanford degree, which I was really disappointed. In. But I have set out to try to figure out how we can lower student debt. And I'm going to share some of that stuff with you. So obviously, you know, our students get loans that, you know, to be able to go through the program. We do give out some scholarships and I'm always actively looking for philanthropic funds to come into the program to be able to give students uh, some funding. And so we have a small amount of funding. Most students get uh, somewhere between, not most students, I should say, about less than 30% of our students actually get some of these awards. They're not need-based. They're based on how well you meet the mission and goals of the program. Um, and they tend to be about two to 5,000, although we have had ones that have been much larger than that. We are a highly competitive program for the National Health Service Corps Scholarship. So this past year, we had five students who qualified for that, so they had their education paid for. And sort of something I think is pretty novel. Um, I, if you remember, I had talked about that our program was also set up to be a pipeline to the Stanford healthcare community. And so graduates from our program that stay within the Stanford healthcare community um, are actually eligible for a loan repayment program. And so right now we have about 40% of our graduates from our first three classes who are staying and working in Stanford Healthcare and have qualified for this. And the payment for this is about $60,000 that's paid out over three years. So we're doing all we can to try to, to get the cost down of this. Uh, and that's it, that's all I have. So I will open it for questions. Oh, excellent, thank you. Um, so I'll open up with the first question. The first question, what is the data and acceptance rate at Stanford PA program? Can I can I ask, uh, and I'm sure you'll be okay if I shared this data, is 100% of people that don't apply don't get in. So but that is a caveat. <laughs> I, missed what, I missed what you said. 100% no, said of, oh, that don't apply, don't get in. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> that's one yeah. I don't know for sure. Yeah, and that's, you know, that's the one thing I, I do hear applicants say, I have no chance of getting in, so I'm not going to apply to Stanford. And I would say, you'd be surprised, you know, that 
I look at an applicant who has a 4.0 GPA, is knocked it out of the park, right? But there's nothing else about them, that they don't tell me their passion for wanting to be a PA, their passion for maybe to work in underserved communities, whatever that is. That student's not going to get in. Somebody with a lower GPA who really can speak to the passion of the profession and what they want to do with their career, they're going to get in. And you don't have to have gone to a top 10 Ivy League school or any of that. Um, and I hope you'll hear from that from some of our students that are on the, the student panel. But it's really showing us that you can handle the academic rigor and then show us really your passion and drive in the profession, what you want to do with the career and leadership opportunities. Um, I think I answered the question about statistics. So we you know, have about 2,500 applicants. Um, those... None of us know how to report this. Those are like that apply to your program. And then we had 1,500 that met all of the things to then get reviewed for our admissions um, team. And then we probably end up giving, it varies from year to year, but about 40 offers to get to our 29, 28 um, applicants. So it's a very low acceptance rate. It's a low acceptance rate. For the PA profession across the country, it's highly competitive. Right. And I, I think it's very intimidating for a lot of yeah. you know, students, but that is the nature, not only of Stanford, but, you know, yeah. getting ourselves into. I, and I, I can I share a couple of things? I want to, because I, I do, I think that's one of the things is that I want people to have a little bit more confidence to apply to a program like Stanford. So without, I don't want to give names, but we had a student who um, did not do well in undergrad. Um, and actually wouldn't have met the cutoff for most PA programs around the country, but then went and got a graduate degree and knocked it out of the park. And we took that student. So, you know, I think those, those are, you know, cases, and we have plenty of students who've come through our program where they did community college first and then went on to a UC school and then came to our program. So that's not an uncommon scenario either. So I hope that encourages people to, to apply to our program. Right. And the fluidity in your, or the variability in the recommendations and the requirements kind of show, as you said before, where you're, you know, what you're really looking for. I have my own question. Is sure. so you were mentioning, I think Stanford is unique in that the MD and the PA program do their first quarter together. They do all five quarters. They do one course together for five quarters. Uh, I see. It's, and you mentioned with the university goals, you know, preparing them for the Stanford healthcare model. How does that change or define how the how a PA functions at, at a Stanford hospital, given that that's the way they're trained? So that's a really interesting question. And I, you know, it may be hearing more from our PAs that have graduated from the program and went into the hospital. Um, when we first arrived, when Rhonda Larson, our associate program director and I arrived at Stanford, people didn't even know there was a PA program at Stanford. Um, and we were shocked because we both came from areas that really utilize PAs we were shocked at how many physicians had never worked with PAs. And so I think that's really changing. But this model of training side by side, I mean, when I was in Boston, I remember I did my OBGYN rotation with the medical student that I had been with, and it was great. And then he became an attending and I knew him later. And it's, you know, and then you know how each other work. And so I, I think it's evolving, but I do think that that model, you know, knowing the capabilities of each other and how you can work together and learning that really early, I think is really valuable. And it might be a great question for the student panel as well of what that experience has been like. Excellent. Yeah, I think the thing is, if you don't see something in action, you don't know that it exists. So yeah, yeah. We have a question. Um, this is kind of refers to the personal statements. Um, and so they were asking previous PAs that we had speaking, how they crafted their personal statements. And, and I'd like to turn that question to you and, you know, in the Stanford specific yeah. and in the general, what is. Yeah. The yeah. You know, and I will throw a little provocative comment out there is that with this new AI, I don't know what people are going to do with essays moving forward. Right. Because, you know, we, we sometimes question how much did someone write an essay and now moving forward? I don't know. I mean, for right now, we're not making any changes. We um, we really want to see that people clearly understand the PA profession. Um, and so mislabeling the profession in your essay is probably not a good idea. So using things like 
you know, physician apostrophe as the assistant using mid-level provider. Um, I can't think of them, but we see many different times where people will actually refer to the profession even by name and correctly or As assistant to doctors. That's another one. Exactly. Or, or yeah. in the essay saying, I'm just so looking forward to assisting this, you know, physician. It, it's so you can get your, you really make sure that you know the profession before you write the essay. So we want to see how well, you know, we want to hear that, you know, about the profession that you understand sort of how healthcare works um, and, and that's kind of in the body of the main essay. And I think most people do quite well speaking to that. Um, and then for the Stanford specific questions, you know, how well you fit the mission and goals of the program. I mean, we just, you know, we ask you to pick one and, and speak to that. And I think most people do that quite well. And I think the piece of advice I would have is don't tell us what you think we want to hear. Tell us tell us what you really think. And that will go over, because we can tell when you're just telling us what we want to hear. You know, um, I'll give you a great example of this. We used to allow people, you know, we would say, speak to a, a, you know, a goal and people would speak to numerous goals. And someone would say, well, I want to work in underserved and I want to work at Stanford. And it's like, like at the same time. And I was like, well, you do realize that Stanford's like not an underserved, like we have underserved areas, obviously in the Bay area, but it's kind of hard. Like, and that clearly to us felt like you're just trying to tell us, you're just checking the boxes on our goals. When those two goals we recognize in some ways compete against each other. And we struggle with that internally as a program, but we want to encourage students, whatever pathway they want to take, but be true to yourself. You know, I think the more honest you are in your statement about, you know, what you really want to do, don't, don't say you want to go into primary care or underserved, but that's not where your passion is. Um, and a program like Stanford, you don't have to tell us that. If you want to do sub, sub, sub specialty surgery, that's okay. <laughs> you know, we we won't hold that against you. But uh, I think a lot of applicants sometimes, you know, they'll say they want to go in underserved and they have no plan to do that. And I, it, it shows through in your, your essay when you do that. Yeah, I think that is a difficult thing to convince applicants of is to be honest, to be honest. <laughs> yes. So, you know, consumed with, with making sure you come across the way that you would like to. Yeah. We have a question that is specific to kind of the details um, of the application. Would it hurt an application if they didn't have a PA letter recommendation? I think you, you touched on this as well, but I'll let me know. Yeah, we like to see it. Um, I think it's helpful, but, you know, I would rather see a letter for someone who really knows you than someone you spent a week with in clinic. They don't carry, you know, if the person doesn't really know you, it's not going to carry as much weight as someone, you know, that you've worked with more. And we do, um, we equally accept letters from nurse practitioners. We feel like they understand the role as well. So that would be another option. I would strongly discourage um, using family and friends. So we see this all the time where or using your primary care provider to write your letter because you think that they know you, that doesn't, at least for us, I don't know how other people feel about it, but we really want to see someone who can speak to your ability to be a clinician, to academically be successful in the program. So, you know, I guess if they are a family or friend, maybe like, don't tell them, tell them not to say that you're a family friend. Um, because I think that that sometimes, you know, we see things all the time with, oh, you know, this person, I'm a physician and this person babysat my kids and I'm writing their letter of recommendation to get into PA school. Um, yeah. So I don't think it's not that we would completely discard it, but I don't think it carries as much weight as someone who might be able to give a more broad, unbiased opinion. Yeah. And I, I can chime in and say that I've heard from current PA students that they were so concerned they didn't have a letter from a PA, but it turns out that it, they ended up getting in and what matter was yeah. the letter truly. At the end Absolutely. Of the Absolutely. There's a question that came in asking if having a previous affiliation with Stanford, a previous job at Stanford or being in any of the programs, if that uh, is a benefit to them in the application process. That's a really great question. And I'll give you a comment sort of across the board and then I'll speak to it. From an accreditation standpoint, every PA program in the country has to say who they give preference to, and it's on their website. And so to look at that. So if you want to know who we give preference to, 
go and look at our website. And yes, so the reason we give preference to those that had a Stanford connection is because you're more likely to stay within the Stanford healthcare system. And since that's one of our goals, we do give preference to that. Now, it doesn't mean we take everyone that has affiliation with Stanford or worked at Stanford, but it does um, it does make you more competitive as an applicant. But I, I recommend that you do the programs that you're applying to to look to see who they give preference to. Right. Another one we've got. This is again kind of geared more towards the the details of the, the application itself. Uh, they have. A, wondering how exactly the GPA is calculated, if it's the a complete undergraduate GPA, if it's the prerequisite course GPA that you're that the Stanford is looking at. Yeah, so we look at all of them. Um, so I don't know if the applicants see this, but CASPA sends us over, you know, overall undergraduate GPA, science GPA, it has like a couple other GPAs that it calculates. Um, and so we look at all of those um, to see both, you know, the recommended courses as well as the um, overall. So each of those we look at. Okay. Another one of, I guess, one of my own questions. You mentioned earlier, um, uh, applicant was mentioning that they wanted to do or wanted to be a part of, you know, working at Stanford and providing care to underprivileged communities, and that those kind of conflict. Uh, that that's kind of news to me. I was wanted to maybe elaborate on that a little bit and how that manifest. Yeah, I mean, I guess you could. I mean, I guess you could say, well, I'm going to work at Stanford, you know, Monday through Thursday, and then go out to the, you know, rural areas and work on Friday. So it's not completely impossible, but the person didn't articulate it that way. They were, you know, saying that they were going to work at Stanford's, you know, underserved sites, which is, um, that's not typical. Right. Um, so I think that it doesn't mean I mean, I think it doesn't mean that you can't have multiple interests as, you know, a PA, you could want to work in a, I mean, Stanford is a sub, sub, sub specialty. So one of my PA faculties works in like tumor genomics, right? It's like so sub specialized in most cases. We do have, you know, a large network of, and that was one of the things I didn't talk about in the, the clerkship part. So there are like 400 primary care providers who are part of our community network throughout the Bay Area. And so students, you know, will go out and work in some of those areas well in primary care. But for the most part, you know, a lot of our graduates are all working in sort of some of these subspecialty areas, um, the ones that stayed at Stanford. Another great question. Uh, someone initially applied to uh, become an MD physician, but now they're looking at PA school. How would you recommend that they reframe the application? And what does that look like, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, I think it's going to be different from program to program. Um, I must say that, you know, I think for myself and our admission team, we don't want to feel like the consolation prize, right? We don't want to feel like that's not really what you wanted. Um, we've certainly had, you know, applicants that we've taken that applied to medical school and then came to us after, but they were very clear on why. You have to be very clear that you're not trying to go the PA route just because you couldn't get into medical school. And if you think about it at Stanford, like you are going to be with the medical students. So you have to be, you know, you have to be the same caliber to, to be in the program. So um, I would just say, A, be honest. Um, you know, I think people have applied and they try to like, it, it always, I feel like it always ends up coming out somewhere. Someone either directly asks you on the interview and like, are you gonna be honest or not? Um, or, you know, you had an MCAT score. And so why do you have an MCAT score? Well, you have an MCAT score because you applied to medical school. So I would be honest, but I would do some real deep soul searching of why you're now taking this path and be able to articulate that. Yeah, like I would just add that it's a PA school is a little bit more competitive than medical school because there's less spots. So that's correct. Yeah, the um, overall admission to PA school is lower. Yeah, so I've I've heard people say oh, I want to do PA because it's it's less. It's like well, actually, if you look at the statistics, <laughs> it's a little bit more competitive and less position. So yeah, and, and we have heard a lot today from all the speakers saying you know how how <laughs> rigorous it can be because because you know considering the time frame and the information that you need. Yeah. Uh, another question um, in reference to the application itself. 
someone with a lower GPA and then, you know, they, they got their grades up and they had some external circumstances, how does that affect their chances of getting to a program? And will Stanford look at that, you know, whatever extraneous details might have affected their academics? Yeah, we absolutely do. We, um, we look for trends over time. So, you know, someone struggled in their, you know, first couple of years in undergrad. And then after that is done well, I gave an example of somebody who did poorly all through, you know, undergrad, not poorly, but not what they would have hoped. And, but just were able to demonstrate their ability to handle um, difficult coursework later. So I think as long as you can demonstrate that you can handle the coursework, and I do think this is when I think that the standardized test scores are helpful. I know, you know, the, the data doesn't necessarily suggest that there's a strong correlation between how people do on sort of the GREs and do in PA programs. But I think that if you can you know, show that, hey, I've improved my grades, I've got good test scores, I mean, that can help strengthen your application for us. I can't speak to all other programs. But um, again, as long as you're showing it's trending up, and then be forthcoming on these things, because it's like, we notice it. And then if we can't figure out why, right? So, you know, what I appreciate the most is someone saying, my mother died when I was a sophomore in college. And I couldn't concentrate and I bombed all my courses and we're like, okay, well, there's an explanation of why this is. And they did really well after. So maybe it's not that of extreme of a situation, but if you had a time that you struggled, speak to it. I think it's, I think it's always better just to be really direct and hit that head on. Cause if you think we're not going to notice, <laughs> we notice. Right. And we have an, another question, you know, did poorly the last two years because I was a frontline worker during the pandemic, will these affect my chances? And you just finished answering it that I, you, know, you said the most important thing is being very clear and, and um, yeah, um, I can't think of the word, when you can see right through. You Transparent, know? yeah. And I think that particular example, what a powerful essay, right? To be able to speak to, you know, being a frontline worker during the pandemic and like trying to get courses together to get to to follow your passion to be able to take care of these patients i think that's an amazing story but i think you know you need some recent coursework that shows that you can succeed and i think that will be important in reference to the casper test that you mentioned is there a besides having taken it a minimum score um, required for admission? Beyond... There's no score. There's, as I said, we don't actually, we don't, it's not factored in. We look at it, but it's not factored into our admission decision at all. Let's see what else, sorry, I just ended That's up okay. scrolling through. <laughs> Thank you for coming through so much of our questions. Uh, please, uh, the attendees continue to ask whatever you have on your mind. This is one that I think it works really well for the, the students that are coming, but I think it would be great to hear from you as well. What do you think is the hardest and best thing about being a PA in your experience? You obviously have, you know, not only been in practice, but in education, yeah. given all that, what yeah. is your opinion? So, you know, when I think back to, it's a long time, right? I've been, okay, it'll be 30 years next year. Um, I wanted to, you know, I was, I was actually a cardiac sonographer and I was taking care of patients with congenital heart disease and I wanted to, to be more involved in their care and this whole path to get there, to do, a, you know, medical school residency fellowship, you know, and I, someone said, you can go to PA school and you can be back taking care of these patients in two and a half years. That was probably the best thing about the profession is being able to do that, right? I think what was hard initially about the profession is that the sort of recognition by the public, like how many times did I have to explain <laughs> what a PA was? And it's come a long way. And I think that that's um, improvement. But, you know, I, I loved my years in clinical practice. I still practice a little bit clinically. But, you know, having that privilege of taking care of patients, I think that's the best part of the profession, but continuing to explain what we do for a living is probably the hardest thing. I think you have to be okay with not being, you know, the top of the, you know, like polar, whatever the expression is. And as long as your passion is about taking care of patients, then I think it's a good fit. Right. Uh, in terms of PA and the healthcare model, we hear a lot about PA versus MD and PA versus NP. Yeah. Um, how much does that question matter 
in, in the interviews and the admission process when students are being asked to compare the two and why they chose PA specifically, if you could elaborate. Yeah. Yeah, I do see quite often where people talk about, you know, in their when they're talking about their passion of why they want to do this, they really don't differentiate. They tend to focus on taking care of patients, right? Well, you can take care of patients in many different professions. So I think it's really important to speak to why PA profession, right? And it's a little like thing that I have and maybe not everyone has, but don't just tell me it's about work-life balance <laughs> because you can go to medical school and be a pediatrician and work three days a week like my pediatrician. And I think she has a better work-life balance than most PAs I know. So I hear that all the time. And, you know, maybe it's true in some circumstances, but like, don't lead with that. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, the, the, the thing about the profession that really people embrace is this lateral mobility um, to change professions. I think most of us don't, um, but having that there is really what sets us apart from, you know, the MD and NP professions. And I think that if you're asked, you really need to be able to speak to what is unique about the PA profession that is different than some, any, not just N, NP and you know, MD, like how is this different from any, you know, OT, PT, any of these other type of professions where you're taking care of patients. Right. And, and the other thing is I would add is um, asking uh, Dr. Jameson this question, like it requires you, I mean, you're going to spend 30 years in a career, do some research. There is a lot of information that you could read, scope of practice, um, mm -hmm. you know, from state to state is different the different, you know, between a physician and the, so like do that research. It's not a 30 second answer. It's actually yeah. going out there. That's why PA schools and medical schools and all of these are requiring you because they want this, you make an informed decision for the next 30 years of your life and not just something that you heard a 30 second sound bit, you know, I mean, we had a, a couple of PAs this morning, like one of them went from being a dermatologist to a neurosurgery PA. And so there's a lot of these things that you have to spend some time researching and it's, you know, your own discovery, you know, you're going to spend all this time to prepare for these careers, but also spend 30 years for it to make sure that's why it's so important to going out there and seeing the different roles in practice. And, and, you know, and, and yes, the work-life balance is one of them, you know, but also know a dermatologist that she only works like <laughs> two days a week and goes to Botox parties and makes enough money to <laughs> you can drive a fancy car. Yeah. You know, right? <laughs> yeah. And so it's just, it's just, it's, you know, you could find like, you know, the, the, the beauty of it is they charge you all this money to become a doctor, a PA, whatever. And after you're done, you have this freedom to do whatever you want to do. So if you, um, I know a friend of mine who's a trauma surgeon who only works, you know, two 24 hour shifts a week and the rest of it is, you know, mountain climbing or skiing or doing other stuff. Yeah. So, I mean, it just, it, it's, it just depends. And so I think being able to like critically look at, you know, what each profession does and your scope and, and where you end up is those are all really important that you have to, to do that. And, and we get those a lot on these calls that come in and it's just like, you know, everybody has their own reason to do certain things. And obviously you were a sonographer and you wanted to expand your scope of practice and, you went and became a PA and, and, and the time of it is, is a big thing. You know, PA is only, you know, three years versus medical schools, four years and then residency, yeah. but also in medical school, you can't, you know, once you're done with your residency, if you want to go from, you know, being a pediatrician to a neurosurgeon, you're spending another seven years where yeah. PA doesn't have to do that. And so I, I just recommend people, like, if you're going to spend your life 30 years doing something, do a little bit of research and getting yourself out there and talking to people. Absolutely. And the other part too is, you know, which was something I considered was, you know, the total cost, you know, even our program is expensive, but it's not as expensive as if you went to medical school, certainly at Stanford. And so, you know, decreased cost, decreased time of training, getting to be with patients more quickly, the lateral mobility, but yeah, this is a huge investment that you're going to make and you really need to do your research. It's not just preparing for an interview question. It's, it's making sure that you're making the right choice. Yeah. And also taking out a pen and paper and doing charts of, you know, pros and cons and yeah. 
yeah. and, and putting those out there. I think those are really uh, big, important things. Yeah, absolutely. Have those pros and cons lists scattered. <laughs> old binders. Um, I, I think what we're talking about now and what we'll close soon really highlights um, the importance of having, you know, the shot, the experience. And that's why it's often so heavily required for a PA school to know what a PA does. And, yeah. and we do have our last question in reference to that is what, in your opinion, is well, there's no best way, but the best way to get the, the clinical hours or yeah. the, the best experience. Yeah, I will say we don't require shadowing. We don't look at that at all in the process. I think that's our hope is that if you've made a decision to pursue the PA route that you've done your homework and you understand the profession and maybe spent time with folks who are PAs. Um, I think there's, you know, as far as getting shadowing experience, um, Stanford does have its um, uh, email that you can uh, send to, which is visiting. I'll throw it in the chat before I leave. Um, it's like visiting observer at stanford.edu or something like that. And you can email them and they'll um, try to connect you with someone to do a, um, some shadowing. But another great way is actually join some Facebook groups. Um, so for those moms that are out there or want to be moms, there's a PA moms um, Facebook group that has 13,000 PA moms on there all over the country. And if you need to shadow, you just throw it out there and there's usually somebody that will take you. Um, but I'm sure there's other groups like that too, but it's uh, social media is a great way to connect with the PA community um, to get those opportunities. But, you know, it's, it, you're not going to know what a PA does unless, you know, you have those opportunities. And some, some places have virtual um, shadowing. I've seen some advertisements for that too. So you can look into that. Well, excellent. I can't tell you how much we all appreciate your time on this weekend, mm -hmm. answering your questions and, and uh, giving us the insights. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, and we look forward to seeing, you know, some more applications from this group. So that'd be great. <laughs> right. I'll put myself on mute. I'll throw that uh, email in the thing and then I'll log off. Thank you. Thank you again for coming today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.